<clears throat> so uh, today I'd like to tell you about some of the things that we've been doing to understand uh, photosynthesis in purple bacteria and also the nature of, co of the coherent phenomena that have been observed in photosynthetic systems. Okay. So purple bacteria make um, a beautiful model system. I think many, many of you in the audience um, would agree with me on that, I think. Uh, so in purple, purple bacteria, we have these beautiful uh, symmetric <coughs> ring-like structures, the LH2 complex that does the uh, light gathering um, the harvesting of, of solar energy, and then trans uh, that then transfers that energy to a larger LH1 ring-like structure uh, that surrounds the reaction center where the primary steps of um, conversion occur, where the initial charge separation happens. And I'd like to just acknowledge the wonderful contributions to understanding this, uh, this system made by Klaus Schulten and, and many of his um, former group members who are here in the audience today. And I think, uh, I believe later we'll probably be seeing a beautiful molecular movie um, that follows the processes of light harvesting in this system. Okay, so uh, all of these events are occurring on ultra-fast timescales, so on, on picosecond timescales typically. Now, um, the, so I'm gonna focus on uh, today, sorry, let me back up a moment. Um, so lately my group has been looking um, at <coughs> the, uh, the, the processes in, in live bacteria, but today I'm going to focus on what happens at the reaction center. Um, and that's a good place to start for talking about coherence in photosynthetic systems because uh, the very first experiments done in the early 90s um, that, that illustrated coherence in a, in a biological system using uh, ultra-fast spectroscopy were done by, the, by Martin Voss and Jean-Louis Martin uh, in some beautiful pump probe experiments. And what they saw was that when they looked at the uh, bacterial reaction center, they saw these very clear oscillations that occurred um, on the same time scale as the primary charge separation events. And uh, for that reason, they questioned uh, whether these might be involved in, uh, in the process of charge separation. There have been, uh, you know, we had a great introduction to electron transfer theory this morning, and um, there's been a lot of work done on, on this system. Uh, I'd like to particularly mention uh, some work by Jose, um, looking at uh, expanding the typical non-adiabatic electron transfer theory to uh, account for uh, the situation where you have vibrational relaxation that is occurring on the same kind of time scale um, as charge separation. Okay, so fast forward now, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy. This is, uh, so we, we, uh, we heard this morning um, about multidimensional spectroscopy uh, being, you know, one, a, a very nice new spectroscopic tool for looking at these types of systems. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the method, um, but basically I think most of you are, are uh, probably familiar with transient absorption spectroscopy or pump probe spectroscopy, where one has a pump pulse that uh, in a photosynthetic system would, you know, put energy into the system, and then one would follow it uh, sometime later with a, a probe pulse. So in two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy, we split up the uh, initial excitation into two steps, separated by a time interval, and then we wait, just as one would in a pump probe experiment, and then we come in with a, uh, a third probing pulse um, that <coughs> causes our, uh, our, our sample to emit, um, uh, uh, the, the polarization to emit a signal that we detect. Now, this was pioneered by uh, David Jonas's group in the late 90s. And um, following his work, uh, there were some contributions made to make the experiment a little simpler to do by uh, the group of uh, Dwayne Miller and Graham Fleming. And following that, it was used um, in 2005 in the first study on a photosynthetic system. So I'd like to just mention some of the information in the spectroscopy. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but basically with these three pulses, we have three time intervals. And when we Fourier transform with respect to the first time interval, that gives us an excitation frequency. And Fourier transforming with respect to the third time interval gives us a detection frequency. So for a fixed T2 waiting time, uh, we get one of these two-dimensional spectra. And there's a lot of rich information in, the, in these spectra. Um, so 
one uh, sort of optimizes the time resolution and frequency selectivity. Uh, what I mean by this is that in a pump probe experiment, if one wants very high time resolution, then you have to use very broad laser pulses. And then one loses the information about what uh, excitation has, be, has, has been made. Here, by um, resolving the signal as a function of T1, we, uh, we get this additional excitation frequency so we can correlate uh, the excitation with, with the detection, um, all with uh, sort of optimum time resolution that's given by the Fourier transform method. We also can detect um, inhomogeneous and homogeneous broadening. These are separated by the uh, elongation of, um, of a transition along the diagonal. And um, we also get very useful information about coupling and energy transfer from these cross peaks. So if you picture a pump probe measurement, one would integrate along this excitation frequency axis and sort of combine these diagonal and off-diagonal signals. Uh, so with, with two-dimensional spectroscopy, we can um, separate those out nicely. But more important for this talk is uh, the ability to probe coherence with this type of spectroscopy. So uh, for example, if I have a, an energy level structure like this, then I'm just going to draw a typical signal contribution um, that, that uh, could arise in, um, in a, a situation with an energy level structure like this. Uh, so I have two, for example, I could, I could think of these uh, levels here as arising from um, two pigments in the system where I have some inhomogeneous broadening, um, and these could be weakly coupled, uh, for example. So in my first, my first laser pulse, uh, I could, for example, excite a coherence between the ground and first um, electronic state. And uh, the second, um, now I could, for example, excite a coherence between E1 and E2. And, um, and then with the third pulse, um, I would now be in a coherence between uh, the ground state and, and E2. And um, so in this type of spectroscopy, during this T2 waiting time, um, then what I will see is that, uh, so I can read out in my two-dimensional spectrum, uh, this particular signal would, would show up here because I know what my excitation and detection frequency are in these time intervals here. And uh, this, uh, this signal would oscillate at the difference frequency between these, uh, these energy levels here. Okay, and so I would see this, this peak here um, change as a function of time if I were to, to look at many 2D spectra as a function of, of this waiting time here. Okay, so now um, on to talking about the bacterial reaction center. So here I'm showing the structure, um, and it consists of you know, these two, uh, to a physicist anyway, quite symmetric looking branches, uh, an A and B branch. And um, here there are two quite strongly coupled bacteria chlorophyll pigments, and then um, an additional two bacteria chlorophylls here, and these are pheophyton, which lack the metal center, followed by quinones. Uh, here. And in this system, uh, there has been, you know, quite a lot of work done on the electron transfer mechanism. Um, this is one of the proposed routes, is, is sort of a, a, a single pathway model where the initial charge separation occurs between the special pair and this BA pigment, um, followed by transfer to, to HA. Um, so despite the symmetry, the charge separation occurs almost 100% of the time along the A branch. And there have been just a huge number of groups who have looked at this. Uh, these are a few review papers. Okay, um, there have also been some alternate uh, charge separation pathways proposed as well. Um, now, if, if one looks at the linear spectroscopy, here uh, we see <coughs> that the strongly coupled special pair gives rise to this red shifted uh, P band. And then uh, these two B pigments here give rise to this peak here and the pheophyton uh, to this H band here. Um, this is very nicely structured uh, compared to what one finds in plants, the photosystem II reaction center, uh, which is structurally very similar. Um, but unfortunately, in that system, all of the pigments overlap uh, spectrally. They all pretty much have uh, very similar absorptions. OK, so these are the two graduate students who worked on this system. Um, and we, in fact, studied a mutant um, that lacks the, the, the QA. The reason for doing this is that we wanted to look at the very initial charge separation steps. Uh, if we go all the way to QA, then we have trouble using our kilohertz laser because the charge separated state lasts too long. Okay, 
So here I'm going to play a movie uh, that shows the 2D spectra as a function of waiting time. And um, so this, to orient you, the, this is the P transition. Uh, B is in the middle and H is on the end on the right side, the higher energy. And so at early times you can see um, some interesting structure here in the B band. The asymmetry here comes from the fact that the BA and BB pigments are not identical. And uh, we can see already within a, a few hundred femtoseconds, actually even faster than that, we have uh, energy transfer occurring between B and P and H and B. And now already you can see energy transfer from H to P in this cross peak here. So we can take this, um, this movie and there's really a lot of very rich information here. So what we've done, uh, we recently published uh, an article in uh, PNAS that gives the details, so I'm, I'm going to just give the main results here. Uh, but basically, knowing um, the structure and, the, um, and starting with an excitonic model for the system, what we could do was basically fit um, using a, a global analysis method, uh, simultaneously fit the linear spectra and um, the time-dependent 2D spectra, uh, identifying um, sort of spectral signatures of, of the intermediates uh, in this charge separation reaction. Okay, and so we were able to also extract the time scales uh, for the charge separation process, as well as the spectroscopic signatures. Also of interest, um, so the, in this, the strongly coupled special pair, the lower, um, the lower energy exciton state uh, is strongly allowed but the upper exciton state is very weak and it had been proposed to be buried within the B band. This um, actually showed up very nicely in our data uh, at quite a different energy than had been proposed um, previously in the literature. And this is just to show you the quality of the fits that we could get. So the, the top row is the data, um, the bottom row is our, is our model. Uh, we also were able to extract Stark shifts that occur uh, during this, the charge separation process. Okay, so now coming back to the coherent phenomena, I think we'll hear from Greg Engel next. Um, so he was the first using 2D spectroscopy uh, to uh, report coherence in photosynthetic systems in a paper in 2007 that looked at the Fenna Matthews Olsen complex. And uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, particular positions on the 2D spectrum will oscillate as a function of this T2 time um, at a difference frequency that corresponds to um, the energy level difference uh, between the, the, uh, the, superposi the states that are in superposition. Uh, and what, what he found uh, was that when looking at the frequency content of these oscillations, that it matched quite well with difference frequencies uh, given the electronic energy differences uh, from the excitonic model of FMO. And so from that, they proposed that they were observing electronic coherence and wondered whether that coherent um, energy transfer could, could be more efficient. So there's been a huge amount of work done in the community since that first paper. And uh, a lot of people have questioned the role of vibrations in the observations and potentially in, uh, in their importance for photosynthetic function as well. So this, I can't do justice to all of this in such a short talk. Uh, so I'll just give you a, um, some you know, uh, future reading should you be interested. Um, in, so in my group, we initially looked at the Photosystem II reaction center, and uh, this is basically a, a plot that shows all of the main modes. So we observed coherences in that system, and um, the frequencies that we observed are plotted here, uh, and on top, uh, we, we also plot known vibrational modes for the system, and we found good coincidence with uh, almost all of the modes that we observed. Uh, we also went further to examine the possible importance for particular modes in charge separation and proposed that, uh, it, that they, they may be important, functionally important. Um, and now back to the bacterial reaction center. So uh, the same year as, as uh, Greg, Greg Engel's FMO experiment, uh, the Fleming group also looked at the bacterial reaction center with a two-color photon echo experiment and observed oscillations that they reported as being caused by electronic coherence. Um, there have been a few other groups uh, who have looked mainly at the oxidized reaction center and reported coherences as well. Okay, so I, I, what I'm going to do now is take our movie that I played for you earlier and um, 
take those snapshots as a function of T2 and perform another Fourier transform. And now, now I'm going to have sort of a three-dimensional frequency cube. And if I take a slice at a particular uh, omega-2 frequency, that's going to basically show me where in the 2D spectrum uh, are things oscillating at a particular frequency. And what's nice about these kinds of what, what I call coherence maps uh, are that they can tell us a lot about the physical origin of coherence. So if, given a known energy level structure, uh, what one can do is use perturbation theory to draw out all of the possible diagrams that could lead to a uh, coherently oscillating signal and plot where they should appear on, on a 2D spectrum. Um, so in this case of a purely electronic dimer where I have um, just two electronic energy levels, then one, get, one would expect a very simple structure to this type of coherence map where um, on either side of the diagonal, the cross peaks would oscillate. This is in uh, the so-called rephasing spectrum. Um, on the other hand, if I have a purely vibrational um, coherence, so this could arise, for example, from uh, this simple displaced oscillator model. So I have two shifted harmonic oscillators, each with a single uh, excited vibrational level on them. In this case, I can map out all of the possible coherent signatures, and I get a very different looking pattern. It looks more like a chair. Okay. So back to the data. Uh, so what we've done is we've looked at the bacterial reaction center. We've also studied the monomer pigment. This is an important control experiment for purely vibrational coherence. And here I'm showing you uh, what, what we call the Frobenius spectrum. This is taking um, those uh, that, that three-dimensional frequency cube and integrating along omega-1 and omega-3 to show you all of, the, uh, all of the frequencies that show up anywhere along the 2D spectrum, okay? And the blue lines here are uh, modes that have been reported from either resonance Raman or, uh, or fluorescence line narrowing experiments. Um, and so the red is the BRC and the, the uh, orange is, is the monomer, bacterial chlorophyll. Uh, so we see very good agreement with known vibrational modes for most of the modes abo above about 400 wave numbers. Um, now I should note here that the initial experiments by Martin Voss and Jean-Louis Martin, they reported modes that were quite low frequency. That was because they were using uh, longer laser pulses, uh, mainly. And um, here you'll notice that we're seeing um, really quite high frequency modes as well. Now, as I mentioned, there's a lot of information in those coherence maps. Uh, so if I compare the monomer to the, the reaction center, um, so I find that the monomer looks quite a bit like that expected chair structure, except that um, due to inhomogeneous broadening, I have to sort of smear the chair along those diagonal lines, okay? But the signals are pretty much where we expect them to be. Um, in the bacterial reaction center, I see uh, quite a lot of additional structure that cannot be explained by either um, that those either of the, the two simple models that I mentioned, the purely electronic dimer um, or the uh, purely vibrational um, displaced oscillator model. Okay, so these signatures particular, uh, in, in particular cannot be uh, described within that model, um, nor can this sort of lack of um, amplitude along the diagonal. There's been one proposal that this can occur during rapid energy transfer. Uh, we're not completely convinced of that because there are some maps that we see in the monomer where, uh, where we see something similar. Um, I'd like to point out that these coherence maps also sh show something um, that, that's quite interesting. These peaks here uh, that I'm, I'm no uh, noting, one of them here with the arrow, um, this is the location of this upper exciton that we identified. Um, and it shows up weakly uh, in the 2D spectra themselves, but it shows up really beautifully uh, in these coherence maps. So sometimes very weak transitions can, can show up quite strongly in these coherence maps if they're strongly coupled to, uh, to vibrations. There are other, so there are quite a few frequencies that I mentioned that show these uh, signatures that we cannot explain by purely vibrational or electronic coherence. And um, what we're doing at the moment is we're working to explain these signatures. And what we found is that we can, we can describe these signatures uh, if we consider taking one of the special pair states and coupling it to that neighboring bacterial chlorophyll pigment, including um, a single vibrational level on the ground 
and excited electronic state. <clears throat> and within that um, picture, this collective state representation, what we can do is come up with diagrams that uh, reproduce all of the signatures that we see uh, in, uh, in our data here. And so, you know, these coherence maps give us really rich information about the electronic and, and vibrational, the, you know, mixed electronic vibrational structure in the system, the, the vibronic states. Here I'm just showing, um, so from our modeling of the 2D data, we extracted the positions of these different um, transitions corresponding to the excitons uh, in the bacterial reaction center. And um, here I'm, I'm showing bars that indicate the energies of the different coherences that were most prominent in the data. And what you'll see is that, um, you know, there is a bar that bridges almost all of these energy gaps. So there truly are resonances between vibrations and electronic energy gaps in the system. Um, so to conclude, uh, we've seen, you know, coherence in, in both in the monomer and in uh, the bacterial reaction center with similar frequencies above uh, 400 wave numbers. And we've seen numerous electronic vibrational coherences in the system. The coherence maps themselves give us uh, a very rich, uh, give very rich information about the uh, excitonic and vibronic structure. Um, and they also tell us about the nature of coherence in these systems. And so what we're working on now is um, building a model that can describe the coherent signatures. Um, and then once we're confident that all of those can be described, we aim to test, uh, use that model to test for the functional relevance of these uh, electronic vibrational resonances. Um, yeah, so I'd just like to thank Andrew and Veronica, who were the, the two main people who have worked on, on the work, and NSF for funding, um, and collaborators, uh, Chris Kermeyer and Dewey Holton for samples, and you for your attention. Thanks very much, Jennifer. That was very nice. Um, any questions? So, <coughs> it's beautiful experiments. I'm just trying to digest everything. It's a lot of information in there. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, you show a very simple diagram where you have HA star, HB star, and some times. Mm -hmm. But you're right on a rate format. But actually here you have oscillations. So how do I digest that diagram in, in terms of uh, your final stuff? How many states you're actually oscillating back and floors and how much is actually a rate? Right, so, so actually the, the rate kinetics model that I showed you, uh, that ignored the coherences. Um, so that, that completely ignored the coherences. And how many oscillations can you actually see when you digest all the data to apply to the gel? So, uh, so our experiments were done at 77 Kelvin. And um, basically we see, you know, much like uh, Jean-Louis and, and uh, uh, Jean-Louis Martin and Martin Voss saw, you know, we, we see, um, you know, that these coher coherences occur on the picosecond time scale. Um, so depending on those, those modes, you know, some of them are quite high frequency and we see many oscillations before they die out. Mm -hmm. Do you see the electronic state going back and forth? Is there a reason? Now, so, so this, is, this is what we've been trying to figure out. What we believe that we're seeing, so um, what, what can describe the coherent signatures in the data is to couple the special pair with uh, the neighboring B pigment with what one of the uh, particular vibrations that we see. And th so that sort of coupled picture where, where there is mixing of the electronic uh, and vibrational degrees of freedom, that, that can uh, describe the data. Can, can you say a bit more about where the vibrations are actually localized? Mm -hmm. what, what modes are we talking about uh, that are important? Yeah, so these modes, um, you know, the, these are bacteriochlorophyll modes. So some of the very low frequency modes that were uh, identified by Voss and Martin, um, those, they, they did some experiments where they did mutations um, to, to, uh, to the protein around the chromophores, and they saw shifts in those very low frequency modes. These higher frequency modes really are coming from the pigments themselves. You know, the, the frequencies match the monomer frequencies quite well. Um, so these are, you know, these are macrocycle modes, uh, distortions of, of the entire, they're, they're the entire macrocycle. Modes. They're bending modes, right? Of, of uh, I mean, some of them are ring, ring modes ring and, ring yeah. 
Any more questions? Low f frequency vibration mold, the electronic molds. Do you have a picture of where the electron is and where the molds are vibrating? Can we can we come up? Uh, so this is this is uh, this. I'm is trying to come up with something on my right. mind that I'm yeah. having. So um, it's interesting because you know we we don't have a very good picture of this yet. Um, for example, if we if we put the vibrations on the um, on on the special pair. And couple them to the, the B pigment with no vibrations, then we don't we find that we're not reproducing the signatures here. Um, so I, I think that like my, my picture is that the vibrations, uh, you know, that we have the, these modes are common to all of the pigments that are that are doing the light harvesting and the electron transfer. Um, and you know, there have been proposals by a number of theory groups, um, and David Jonas in particular talks about um, you know how these modes can in fact modulate interpigment distances and um, modify energy transfer pathways I imagine they could also do this with with electron transfer as well mm -hmm. so may I ask just a, a final question oh. so there have been recent reports like last year that Donata Sigmatis and um, other groups in which they put into question the interpretations that we have of these data. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether you have a particular opinion of where this debate is going and how we might move forward mm -hmm. from that debate. Yeah, so I think that um, I think it's clear that that you know the initial interpretation of purely electronic coherence is not correct. Um, I think you know looking at the being able to describe the complete coherence map uh, that can give a lot of very useful information. Um, you know, Zygmantis has also done these nice polarization dependent experiments uh, that can do much the same thing, that can, t can identify vibronic uh, coherence. Um, but, you know, here also, I think by, by looking at the monomer, you know, doing the, the right control studies, we can say what type of coherence this is. But, you know, really testing the functional importance, this is where, um, this is where I think we need to rely a lot on theory and then we also need to rely on model systems as well um, being able to so it, you know it's 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 very tricky in these systems to modify just the electronic structure or just the vibrational structure um, it's easier to do that in in simpler you know donor acceptor systems so I think that we can use those uh, to test some of these ideas well let's thank well so from what I understand, it's not just, a, yeah, originally it was uh, the critique on the electronic coherence, but Sigmanta's work on last year gave me the impression that even though he has these polarization dependent experiments, he was still putting in doubt the origin of these vibronic coherences in the excited state. So it seemed to me that even that claim seemed to be put into question by oh, I think his I work. So I don't know if it is a yeah. misinterpretation from my part. I think he. I think he is saying that it's vibronic coherence, um, but I think he's saying also that it's it's not clear yet if there's any functional relevance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is the final question because we have to. We are past <coughs> one minute. So I had lunch with Graham about a month ago, and I asked him about that paper. Um, and my understanding was that the data are kind of similar or the same to what. Graham and coworkers, et cetera, have mm -hmm. published, but it's in the interpretation. Yes. And then w when you get into the multitude of electronic, vibronic l modes, that is, there are so many modes that can be involved, then the uh, modeling leads to a different conclusion. So it's the same data, but how you analyze the contribution of the different vibronic modes. And so I just put that out. I'm not Graham, I'm just